Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's <laughs> help on being attacked. <laughs> the war on drugs is ended. Yeah. The war on drugs just got violent. Th thank you very much. Thank you. So welcome once again to this evening's uh, public lecture event to mark the launch of the report that all of you, I hope, have after the drug wars by the LSE expert group on the economics of drug policy, hosted here at LSE Ideas. Before we begin the evening, I want to make sure to thank the Open Society Foundation and the British Council for their generous financial support on this effort. My name is Danny Kwa. I'm Professor of Economics and International Development here at LSE. And I am also director of the Southeast Asia Center. And on this occasion, fortunate enough to get to chair the LSE expert group on the economics of drug policy. This, as you will all know, is a watershed time in the evolution of ideas and narratives on the international drug war. In just a few weeks, the United Nations General Assembly special session on drugs will convene, uh, something that entire nation states, different civil society groups have all tried to have an input in, and our, our research efforts have tried to help inform that discussion. In many people's minds, there is, the narrative that's out there now is that there's an old system and there's a possible new system. The old regime in that narrative is one characterized by the war on drugs. It was characterized by a prohibition type of mindset. It was violent. It was draconian, it was costly. It was tragically damaging of global development. And even if you don't subscribe to all of that description, in many people's views, even on its own internal merits, it was counterproductive and ineffective. The UN General Special Assembly session provides an opportunity to recast our conversation. Now, in the minds of some participants, we must move forwards, and move forwards in particular towards not looking at the drug market, its production, the production of drugs, the exchange, their consumption in isolation. We should emphasize public well-being. That is what should take priority over efforts of interdiction. We should be focused on health and access to essential medications. We should be looking at policies that embrace harm reduction on both the demand and supply sides. And in the midst of all this, we should be undertaking rigorous experimentation with different regimes for legal regulation. The bottom line in this way of thinking should be contro uncontroversial. It takes three prongs. The first is that health and well-being of humanity, that is what matters. The second is that drug control goals cannot take priority over other dimensions of progress and development, notable among them human rights and civil rights. And third, the change that needs to occur at, in global regulatory reform has to be driven by changes at national and local levels. Now I'm gonna turn over to our panel of distinguished speakers on this, these general topics in just a minute but I thought I would take at least a couple of seconds to say what the role of LSE Ideas is in this. LSE Ideas is a university think tank. We have a project advisory board of extremely distinguished persons. Why are they involved? Why is LSE Ideas involved in a project like this? Many of the people involved who have put their names and signatures onto this report are not ourselves specialists in this area. What special expertise do we bring into this discussion? Well, beyond trying to advance, push along what good we can in the world, we seek in this kind of research and engagement efforts two things. First, that we apply the highest principles in this work of research and engagement, those same principles that have been learned from the best social science and legal scholarship included among them bringing in critical and important lessons from history. Second, that we surface in this work the most rigorously thought through, worked out, evidence-based policy making. And in doing this, this group 
We do not seek to be moralistic one way or the other. We're not trying to argue a left versus right kind of position. We're not saying that a status or liberal democracy type of approach is best. We're not trying to be interventionists or free marketeers. What we want to do here is to be open to the possibility that the historical war on drugs has indeed inflicted tragic and un unnecessary costs on global economic development. But at the same time, we welcome evidence and discussion that parts of it might have been justified or well motivated or indeed truly desired by a nation's population. We want that conversation to occur. We seek out where international externalities remain in our global regime. Bad things that spill over from developed to developing worlds, or indeed vice versa. And we want to understand whether a new regime on international drug policy might be a possible global public good that benefits everyone, but that no single nation by itself would feel incentivized to put in place. In some of our internal discussion, we have emphasized shifting the narrative from simply prohibitionist, either for or against on drug policy, to that policy regime's relation to global development goals more generally. This is because we think it is urgent to fulfill what others have called the ultimate goal of global development, that people everywhere in the world should become dignified agents of their own destiny. Getting international drug policy right is a critical part of that, which brings us to this evening. So this evening, we have on the stage distinguished speakers who will pronounce on our research and on different parts of the thinking here. I'm not going to constantly be getting up, intervening in the, uh, the microphone to introduce each person, so I'll just say who they all are and then invite you to look at the screen and remember. We're going to have Dr. John Collins, who is Executive Director of the LSE Ideas International Drugs Policy Project, the person that I've worked with most closely in this group. Dr. Joanne Chete is an adjunct professor of public health at Columbia University. After her, Dr. Catalina Perez Correa, who is professor and researcher in legal studies at CIDE in Mexico. And last but not least, Xavier Sagredo, who is the regional democratic governance and citizen security advisor at the UN Development Program. I invite you to join me in welcoming them to this stage. Okay, um, first off, I just want to say some very quick thank yous. Firstly, to Professor Danny Kwa, who it's been my privilege to have worked with on this project for the last few years. And what I would say is we quite literally would not have the expert group without him. So I just want to say a big thank you to him. Um, I also want to say a huge thank you to Professor Michael Cox, our incredible director of LSE Ideas, for, for really providing such leadership and such incredible vision on this project and, and more broadly at Ideas. Um, I want to say thank you to Jay Pan and Alex Soderholm because this report and this event would not have happened without them, and to Marta and Joe and, and Dira and, all, and Adriana and all others who have helped put this together. So I just wanted to say those thank yous. Now, before I begin properly, I'm going to do something. Ethan Nadelman is here, so I'm going to steal this a little bit from him. Could I get a very quick show of hands? And this is not very scientific or the, the terms are not very clearly defined, but hands up here who thinks that the war on drugs was a good idea. <laughs> Not a single one. <laughs> Hands up here who thinks that the war on drugs has, quote, failed. Okay, that's, that's pretty, pretty strong support for the motion, so I'll proceed on that basis. <laughs> um, what my research looks at, and what I think what began the International Drug Policy Project at LSE Ideas, was this idea of what is the role of multilateralism in international drug policy? How can multilateral, multilateral cooperation make drug policy better, both at the international and at the national levels? And I think we did, be, we did begin in 2012 with the premise that the war on drugs was, at that time, increasingly discredited, and now it is largely discredited as a strategy at the international level. We have current and former presidents. Uh, we have the Global Commission on Drug Policy. We have our own expert group. We've got Nobel Prize winners, uh, former and current heads of UN agencies who have all, in some way, rubbished this idea that you go to war with already marginalized groups as a means to, to alleviate these problems. And regardless of, as Danny said, whether you, you like some ideas of it or if, if in some ways you're, you're viscerally anti-drugs or whatever it is, 
there's no real international appetite to refight this at the international level. If you go into UN forums or the OAS or wherever it is, barring perhaps ASEAN and, and certain countries, um, there's no real sense of a desire to refight the war on drugs. And that's why we say UNGAS is very clearly, whatever the explicit consensus outcomes, and this is diplomacy, so it's always going to be consensus and lowest common denominator in a lot, in, in a lot of ways, we have shifted to the post-war on drugs era. And so this report was really about trying to inform that, to say, okay, if we're in a new era now, um, how do we drive it in a more rational direction? How do we get away from that dichotomy of, okay, you're either for drugs or against drugs. You're either for more drug war or you legalize everything. How do you, how do you begin to drive policy in a more rational direction? And these are the, the recommendations that I think most clearly came out of this report. Firstly, as, as, as Danny said, you prioritize the SDGs, not drug control goals. Now, that may seem obvious to people who are not used to working in the field of drug policy, but believe me, it's an extraordinarily cloistered field, and it's an extraordinarily narrow, narrow field. It's people focus and talk only about drug policy issues. Um, Professor Cox and myself just came back from Colombia, and they're in the midst of a major peace-building operation, so I'm going to use them as the best example that I can think of this case, that Colombia is now trying to peace-build beyond many decades of conflict and all sorts of complicated socioeconomic is issues which worsen those conflicts. The, the, the figure we say in the report is 65,000 households or 300,000 people in Colombia are in some way dependent on the production in the coca economy. They have no, in most cases, they have no economic alternative away from coca production. So the, no, so the notion that the government should now, as it enters a new era of peace, go to war with those communities or try to rip up their crops and to forcibly move them away from the only crop that sustains them when they have no economic infrastructure, when they are not politically and economically integrated into the core economy, is dangerous, it's pointless, and it's going to produce more conflict into the future. So that's not to say that, oh, well, we've committed to eradicate Co uh, coca production, therefore, you should do it. It's, we're not saying that coca production should not, the goal of prohibition should not in some way be down the agenda. Member states so, in, generally view that as an, a goal of policy, that they want to reduce the reliance on the illicit economy. What we're saying is an unsequenced uh, in, implementation of that policy can produce more harms than good. And that the government needs to focus on the issues of political and economic integration first before it can actually tack tackle the issues related to the illicit economy. And I think the war on drugs was really putting the cart before the horse in, that, in those terms, focusing only on the issues of eradication and interdiction and things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go on on public health because we have Joanne, who's just an extraordinary expert on that, so I'm not even going to try on that. Um, what really also came out of the report, and I think if, uh, a, a number of authors really, it, it, it just crossed all the papers. Um, Michael Shiner, Peter Reuter, Harold Pollack, um, the, the Mark Shaw, there was a few contributors who all, uh, I think Van der Felba Brown as well, all came to a similar conclusion that it's not about eradicating illicit markets, particularly mature illicit markets, because that can, also, that can often produce more harm than good. It can cause spikes in violence, it can cause all sorts of problems. Not always, but it can generally be seen to have these problems. So the focus is instead on how do you reduce the harms of those markets? How do you reduce their interactions with society more generally? And then I think the fourth point, as Danny alluded to, is that we have to see some sort of form of experimentation taking off. That's not to say, well, we're, we're all moving towards legalization now, but it's a case of we can no longer debate this in a theoretical sense. We can't all sit around and say either on the reform side that, well, we just want, we need more debate. We need to discuss the harms of drug policy more. And you can't no longer sit around on the prohibition side, well, there's great risks to trying uh, legally regulated markets, so let's not push in that direction either. We need to have some form of experiments run that we can actually have an empirical base to go with these discussions. And so that we, we do clearly say within the report that this is, this is going to pr provide a, a rigorously monitored, this will provide a social scientific base for discussions going forward, and that's why we think it's a good idea, provided it conforms to strict public health and human rights principles. Now, this is really my focus, and I think this is about adding nuance to the discussions at the international level, because... Again, as I said, we're beyond the point of we need more debate. And we've currently, in many cases, got a circular logic at the international level which says we, we've got a set of treaties. They are, quote, unquote, about prohibition. And without changing those treaties, you can't change national policies. 
and we're not going to change those treaties until we have evidence. So without, without changing the treaties, you can't generate evidence, and without evidence, you can't change the treaties. Um, firstly, what I'd say is, well, that's, that we have to break that circular logic. But the second point I would make is that that's based on an extremely rigid interpretation of those treaties. And I think the post-war on drugs era is going to rely increasingly on this idea of there is flexibilities, there is contingencies, there is counterfactuals and how these treaties could have been interpreted and implemented. And we need to roll back a little bit and see how we can actually change how that's, how that's been done. Um, and this is what I think is the most personally, I think, is the idea that you want to be governing drug policy over the next decade on. Is this a, a system of cooperative policy pluralism? Managing the spillovers across borders. It's not saying it's a, it's a beggar thy neighbor policy. That's not at all what, what, you're, what you're aiming for. But a sense of different policies likely work for different areas at different times in different contexts. And in the immediate term, as we develop a greater evidence base around that, that's OK. And you want an international system which recognizes that point, that point while pushing states to ensure that their policies are both based on evidence and based on, 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 on human rights norms. Um, we also, I think, having better, having an evidence base is the best inoculation against member states continuing damaging policies. So if we actually have cases of what works and what doesn't work, whatever about international pro, uh, pronouncements and international agreements, that's the best way to, to, to actually focus policy in a better way. And I'd give the case of harm reduction. This is probably the most effective demand, demand intervention tool that we have. It arose from a bottom-up set of responses to an emergencies in the 1980s and 1990s, where the HIV crisis and things like that. Uh, we'd still be debating it today if it was a top-down approach and we wouldn't have changed policies greatly. But it has actually been implemented and has delivered significant, en enormous returns in a, lot of, in, in a lot of the areas. And Joanne, I think, will hit on these more than I would. Um, but what I would say is that we need to also move beyond this idea of the convention's mandate, a quote, prohibition regime. That, that idea came up in the international relations theories literature of the 1990s. I think it was an extremely useful set of, uh, or extremely useful way of framing it in the 90s. And it explained the system that we, we dealt with. From the 1970s onwards, international drug policy was implemented as a prohibition regime. The question was, did the treaties mandate it? And I think historiography since then has very clearly demonstrated that no, the, con the conventions were written as a, as a regulatory framework. They were relatively loose. Member states were not going to tie themselves into anything which would, in any, would severely hamper their national prerogatives. As a member of the International Narcotics Control Board, Francisco Tumi, in his own personal capacity, but he, he wrote for the report, member states did not even define the key delineator between licit and illicit pra uh, uh, drug use, which is medical and scientific use. They said the delineator between what is allowed and what is not allowed technically is medical and scientific use and they didn't bother to define it because they didn't want to, to, re to restrict it. So we've been having these debates about an imaginary, not imaginary, but a prohibition system that apparently cannot change, and yet all of a sudden is changing. And yet all of a sudden we've got this new literature which are highlighting actually it can change a lot more than it already has as, as well. So what I would say then is just this is what we're seeing member states coming down uh, along the lines of. I think these are some of the increasing flexibilities you see at the international level. Europe, it's a quiet sense. They're, they're not comfortable highlighting uh, international agreements as, quote, flexible or that there's, there's scope for reinterpretation because it's just not something Europe does. You know, Europe does not like to be seen to be rocking the, the boat in diplomacy. But what they would say is there is an absence of obligations to pursue. Well, this is what I've heard some, say the Euro some people in Europe say. There's an absence of obligations to pursue detrimental policies. And I think that's key. This sense of, do you go and rip up crops when you know that it's pointless and you know that it actively harms communities? Um, there's been an assumption for some reason over the last few decades that of course you do. Of course you do whatever you can, even if you know it's harmful and even if you know it's ineffective. This is what the State Department has increasingly said. This is what one senior official in the US State Department said um, in 2014. We have to tolerate different national drug policies. And as I think Ethan said at our conference today, that's a monumental change in US rhetoric. That that's, was unthinkable four years previously, that the US would come out and say that you know, there is alternatives to a singular war on drugs. What we have in places like Uruguay and I think broader Latin America is saying, we have very serious uh, human rights and population welfare concerns about implementing certain types of prohibitions. And so we believe that 
the UN, con UN Charter is the, the guardian of human rights obligations, and that is explicitly supreme. This is one of the arguments that is used in Latin American discourses. The UN Charter is explicitly supreme to, uh, to subsidiary obligations such as drug control obligations. So if there's a conflict between implementing something that we think breaches human rights and something which may be seen to breach drug control obligations, we will go with human rights. And that's the, that's the idea that you see percolating Latin America now, is that human rights have to take supremacy well Welfare goals have to take supremacy over drug, drug control goals. This, I'll leave you on this point, but this is, I actually think, a useful way of at least, as we go into this idea of policy pluralism, this is not an altogether terrible beginning of a discussion, which is, how would policy look like if we move beyond the singular, we know the, pro, we know the conventions, we know exactly what they mean, we know exactly what they mandate. If we're trying to get to a point of, okay, we want member states to cooperate and we want to do it in a non-beggar-thy-neighbor way, I think this is actually a useful discussion point or beginning point of that. And this is, again, what the Ambassador William Brownfield from the U.S. State Department outlined. It's that you defend the, the integrity of the core of the conventions. That's nothing to do with prohibitions. I don't have time to go into that, but that's around regulations. Um, and you allow flexible to interpretations on problematic aspects, such as what to do with cannabis regulation at the local level, what to do with coca leaf, things like that. You allow different national regional strategies and you tackle organized crime. There's nothing there which, well, particularly the last one, I don't think is particularly controversial, but it depends on how you do it. So I'm going to leave it there and hand over to our other speakers, but thank you very much. I hear that it's reading week at the LSC. Thank you all for coming when I know you have lots to do. Oh, I appreciate seeing everyone out for this discussion. There's a demographic shift happening in the United States that I think has been surprising to some of our policymakers, an increase in mortality among young and middle-aged white adults, men and women, at a time when mortality among blacks and Hispanics in the same age groups is falling. It's largely due, or so it seems, to drug overdose among people injecting opioids, including in suburban and rural areas. Deaths from opioid overdose in the U.S. are now thought by some people to be at about the rate of deaths uh, from AIDS at a time before there was medicine for HIV. So what we see a lot of in the media uh, these days are local officials, policymakers, editorial boards, et cetera, saying, look, we have to pay attention to this these people are not your average junkies. Let me translate that for you. Uh, these are not the urban black women and men whom, without compunction, we've locked up at historically unprecedented rates for nonviolent drug offenses for the last three decades, denying them health and social services and devastating their families and communities. End of translation. Um, there's a whole new politics then of opioid addiction in the current environment. Somehow the thought of overpopulating our prisons with suburban moms and dads and their children and grandchildren is unappealing to our political leaders. And after a decades long battle with the US Congress over an irrational ban on the use of federal funding for programs like uh, programs that furnish clean injection equipment to people who inject drugs, Somehow, with a spike in Caucasian mortality, the ban has been lifted. Or it's been lifted as far as our selectively ignorant and often craven Congress can manage, which is that funding will be allowed uh, for everything about syringe programs except the syringes. <laughs> but we now are pretty used to getting, uh, taking, being glad for whatever we can get. So there's a lot to be said about this opioid overdose phenomenon that we don't have time for, but um, the tr this trope of these are not just junkies is what I'd like to focus on because it gets us to the heart of a lot of the challenges that we have in crafting drug policy that's based on evidence and good practice rather than on fervid moral judgment. As shown by Dr. Collins' remarkable historical work, there was a time when it was possible to have policy discussions about large numbers of people consuming psychoactive drugs without harming themselves or society, or at least it was possible at the policy level to see that for the economic opportunity that it is. One of the terrible achievements of the drug war, in my view, has been the crafting and the sustenance and the dissemination of this sweeping narrative about the evil of drug use. Uh, 
and a corollary to that has been the creation of a secure platform for moral judgment as a central element of the way that drug policy is made. If most of the people who died of overdose, opioid overdose in the US in the last 20 years had lived in Switzerland, had lived in the Czech Republic, had lived in any one of a number of other European countries or Australia, they would have been much less likely to die because they would have had better access to a wider range of health and social programs that at, might, might have helped them at least avoid the harms of adulterated street heroin. These programs would not have insisted that the only real recovery, to use a word that's important to both UK and US drug policy making, is taking no opioids at all, not even opioid agonist medicines like methadone that have a well-documented track record of helping people get on with their lives. Yes, we see a shift in some places, in some ways, in drug policy toward more health-friendly policies, but there remain some areas of evidence-based health policy and practice that are trumped by the specter of understanding drug use basically as a moral failing. And I just said trumped, and even with a lowercase t, <laughs> I need a synonym. Uh, okay. A few days ago, when the Federal Food and Drug Administration finally put out its action plan for opioid overdose, it included all kinds of things, better packaging of opioid medicines, more use of non-opioid pain relievers, everything except the conclusion that anyone in public health who's worked around opioids would look for, which is that this op opioid overdose epidemic screams out for better, more affordable, more accessible options for medication-assisted treatment of opioid dependence, which has a fantastically better track record than the abstinence-based therapies that are more available. But all drug use is evil, even the use of these medicines, uh, even though people who are doing well in methadone or buprenorphine therapy are in every reasonable sense recovered. They are still the objects of harmful moral judgments. They are still, in some sense, junkies. It's true, as we keep hearing, that more countries, including the US, are standing up in the UN and professing to more health-oriented drug policy or to be investing more in health interventions. Part of this change in rhetoric um, seems to be that drug users are no longer referred to as criminals, but now as patients. This is said over and over again in the UN, uh, even by countries, uh, representatives of countries with very repressive drug laws. I personally don't think that calling drug users patients instead of criminals is much of a step forward for a number of reasons. It's, uh, for one thing, very patronizing and extremely inaccurate because most people who use drugs are not sick because of their drug use. So now we have the new choice of being bad or being sick. It's not helpful. Another, though, is that it seems to have empowered policymakers in a lot of places to call certain interventions health programs that are not, in fact, really health programs, particularly in the area of treatment of drug dependence, and also, to some degree, deciding who needs treatment. There are places in the world where treatment of drug dependence is very little better than torture, and in many less extreme cases, it's really police or criminal justice action and not health action. Uh, for example, as part of the health pillar of their drug policy, a number of countries, notably in Southeast Asia and China, um, lock people up in treatment detention centers uh, that are effectively forced labor camps and indeed are economically important, which adds to their political popularity. But they provide nothing in the way of health care, let alone treatment for addiction. People are thrown into these places for minor offenses. It's not even clear that many of them do have a drug dependence problem. Often they stay there for years without really any hope of health care of any kind. Or we can think about thousands, tens of thousands, of privately run treatment facilities in every area of the world, often um, with some kind of religious affiliation where, and I've visited too many of them, I have nightmares, where beating, starving people, humiliating them, degrading them, are seen to be legitimate elements of treatment of drug dependence and there's no gov government oversight of the quality of care. There are no systems for reporting or stopping abusive practices, and this gets called health, and it's tolerated largely because these are just junkies. The somewhat more humane or seemingly <coughs> humane version of this, that's the one that the US has brought to glorious scale domestically and is pushing very hard as part of its narcotics foreign policy, is the, 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 the case of drug, drug courts, drug treatment courts, as they're called. These courts are meant to offer an alternative to incarceration 
for certain categories of drug offenses in the form of court-supervised treatment for drug dependence. The drug courts are remarkably popular across the political spectrum in the U.S., uh, such as it is. The audit arm of the U.S. Congress rightly called the drug courts in the U.S. a movement in the sense that they spread into every corner of the country and now to many other countries thanks to U.S. evangelism without the benefit of a body of evidence demonstrating that they do any good. The same federal office that helped to set up these courts captured some of the early evaluations uh, that seemed to suggest that the courts have a good record in preventing recidivism, but as some good social science research has shown, these evaluations often didn't have a valid control group or they were looking at courts that clearly cherry-picked their participants uh, to be those who would be most likely to graduate, as the term goes, from the treatment program. And again, after 20 years of drug courts, it's taken, in some ways, the spectacle of middle and upper class white people overdosing in record numbers to uh, make us realize that there's something rotten in the drug courts. And among the rottenest things is that when judges are empowered to make medical decisions, they often get them wrong. And there's no medical malpractice sanctions for them. In particular, many judges come to the bench with this same insidious prejudice against medication-assisted treatment for opioid dependence that we see so often. And so we have story after story of people who, uh, whose best option clinically would clearly be outpatient methadone treatment who are either uh, rejected out of hand as drug court participants and sent to prison or go to the streets and get opiates, and some of them are high risk of overdose, or they're sent to months of expensive resident, residential inpatient treatment that they don't need, as in my fine city of New York. This is to say nothing of the judges who, for example, think that a good solution for the people who fail to graduate from their programs, who fail their treatment, is to put them in jail. Well, that'll show them, um, even though we know that relapse is an expected part of the picture and treatment doesn't always work the first time. Julia Buxton of Central European University, who studied coca farming in the Andes, uh, has helped us to understand that there are fundamental flaws in the way that alleged alternative development or alternative livelihood programs for drug crop farmers have been conceived, and I know that Mr. Segredo will say more about this. One of the problems is that unlike what a development program should be, the real goal of the alternative development programs is reducing the evil of drug crop cultivation, not people's well-being. So they're not designed, implemented, or evaluated with people's well-being in mind. They have another agenda often. And I mention this only because I think there's an analogy with, again, these ostensible public health pillars of our drug policy that we're so happy about. The real goal in many cases is not the health and well-being of people. One of the real goals is likely to be getting people clean, clean, away from the evil of drugs. Clean in this scenario is much more important than safe. And so we preach to young people, even though we know that they are likely to experiment with drugs, that using any drug even once will ruin their lives, the other idiocy that I grew up hearing in, in the classroom. But we don't use the opportunity of classroom-based programs to help young people know how to protect themselves from HIV, from hepatitis, from overdose. Those are the things that would be in the curriculum if we were talking about a real health-oriented drug control regime. And back to opiates, irrational fears of addiction also feed the truly horrific problem of the denial of clinically needed pain medicines to billions of people in the world, uh, clearly related to overzealous drug control measures in many cases, but it's a topic for a longer talk, I'm afraid. So yes, we're seeing some progress, and yes, there is progress, but I'll be more convinced that we're on a path toward real public health-friendly drug policy when I fee see a few things that we don't generally see now or don't see outside a few countries. First, as, as Dr. Collins uh, referred to it, the notion that reducing the harm of drugs without fantasizing that society can be free of drugs really needs to be reflected in policy and programs in a demonstrable way. This is not just a matter of calling drug users patients rather than criminals or saying that drug use is being treated as a health problem without further scrutiny about what that means. Harm reduction is a central part of health, public health policy and practice. 
restrictions on the sale of tobacco and alcohol, restrictions on what people can do when they drive a car, restrictions on toxins in food and water. We don't presume that people will stop driving, eating, smoking, drinking. The member states of the UN in their wisdom can't even utter the words harm reduction. We are very far from being able to use this central tool of public health policy as we need to do in drug control. It would also be great to see drug policy that includes real money for research, qualitative and quantitative, from the point of view of people who are policed and who shouldn't be policed on determinants of drug use and of problematic use, which we recognize to be a very small percentage of all use in most places, internal and external determinants, immediate and structural, structural determinants that come into play. It's not enough to spend $400 million a year as the US government drug research agency will do this year on how parts of the brain are lit up on PET scans by people using drugs. How can there be so many unanswered questions about what Tim Rhodes helpfully called the risk environment for drugs when this is such an old problem? It should be easier to get money for the kind of research that enables us to, us to understand the situations of poverty, violence, marginalization, racism, unemployment, pleasure-seeking, whatever it might be that are part of the motivation for drug use, at least as easy to get money uh, as it is to get the money to feed amphetamines to university students and do brain scans on them to demonstrate that they have a brain disease. Finally, I think it would be wildly refreshing if we could talk rationally about the use, both clinical and recreational, of psychoactive substances as part of human health, even as part of human dignity and human autonomy. The World Health Organization has given the world a, a great broad definition of human health. All of you who study public health policy know it. Health is not just the absence of disease or infirmity, but a state of complete physical, psychological, and social well-being. If we are autonomous people and circumstances allow, we all have ways of looking after our own psychological well-being. And for some people, that means altering consciousness with the help of daydreaming or music or aromas or sex or death-defying adventure or gambling or drugs or whatever it might be, as has been true for all of human history. Obviously, on that list, it's not just drugs that elicit a reaction of moral judgment. But for drugs, this narrative of evil and moral failing is so well established as to be an impediment to sensible policy discussions to good policy and program practice, and to good public health research. So we may be going in the right direction in global drug policy reform, but I think we have a very long way to go. Thanks. Well, uh, hello, good evening. Um, I, I just want to begin very briefly by thanking uh, John for all the work that he did and for uh, Professor Kwa and all the people here at LSE. You've been uh, fantastic and very helpful. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk. I don't know if my presentation is. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, so I'm, I'm going to talk about incarceration and the war on drugs in Latin America. And uh, I just want to uh, tell you very briefly that uh, one of the reasons that I uh, started studying uh, drug policy was because I was studying prisons and to see the amount of people that were imprisoned uh, in Mexico, which is where I'm from, for drugs, uh, made me start looking at what was going on in the prisons and in the way that the drug laws are implemented. So um, I'm going to talk not only about Mexico, but of the uh, other countries. I work with a group called SED, which is the uh, collective for the study of drugs and law. We're academics from nine different countries in Latin America. And what we try to do is to find uh, data from each of our countries to make uh, regional and comparative studies on the enforcement of drug laws in Latin America. So some of the things that I'm going to show you here are from the studies from SED. Um, the last study that we did, we've done several studies, the last one that we did was on incarceration. We tried to find how many people are really incarcerated in our countries, and of course uh, for, for drug crimes. 
Of course, there's a lot of uh, holes because uh, the data isn't uh, easily available. But we found that uh, one out of every five people in prison in Latin America are accused of drug crimes. In Argentina, Brazil, and Costa Rica, over 60% of women in prison are accused of drug crimes. Ecuador, 77% of women in state custody are convicted of drug, drug crimes, which, uh, where in the case of men, it's 35%. And in Mexico, 80% of women at the federal level and 57% of men are also uh, imprisoned for, for drug crimes. So uh, really what we're seeing is the use of, of criminal, uh, the, the criminal institutions. And this is not only prison, it's also police and military, uh, public prosecutors, which in our countries are famous for, for the violations of due process laws. Uh, which are being used to control uh, something that, as uh, you can read it at, in the report, in this one and the previous one and in other literature that is available, has really had no effect on the amount of people who are actually using uh, these substances. And so it really has come, and I, uh, uh, Professor Kaw was saying uh, that, that the war on drugs has had an immense social cost. Uh, this is definitely one of the, the costs that it's had. And... Um, um, so anyway, the, the, the incarceration rate in these countries are above the world, uh, uh, the, the, the incarceration rates that exist worldwide. Uh, on average, there's 144,000, uh, sorry, 144 people for every 100,000 uh, people, in, except the case of Bolivia. So uh, this is, um, you can see this is the prison population for each of these countries that we studied in said, uh, Costa Rica, Uruguay, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, Ecuador, Argentina, and Bolivia. And this is uh, the first column is the total prison population and the rate per 100,000 um, uh, people. And then this is the increase. Of course, the uh, data comes from different years, so it's not per perfectly comparable. Uh, but we can see that there's been a huge uh, increase in, in all these countries in the... Uh, prison population, which is which is happening all over. It's not only Latin America. Uh, but we see that a lot of this increase, at least in, in most of these countries, comes from the people who are imprisoned for drug pop, uh, for drug crimes. So we can see here in the case of, of Peru, for example, and Costa Rica, the, the increase in drug population is almost the same as the increase in the overall uh, prison population. But then Brazil, Colombia, Uruguay, Argentina, and Mexico, you can see that the increase in overall prison population is a lot less than the increase in, in the people who are imprisoned for, for drug crimes. So really what we're seeing is not only is there an increase in the use of criminal law in our countries, but that this use is to uh, enforce uh, these drug laws. And really, when we talk about using uh, these, these laws and these instruments, which is basically prisons, because uh, in our countries, and it, I think this isn't just uh, Latin America, it's the same in the US, when we talk about uh, using criminal law, it's basically talking about prisons. And uh, prison conditions in Latin America, as in uh, Africa and, and Asia, are they have very poor conditions. Uh, one of the main problems is overcrowding. Uh, in Mexico City uh, prisons, 40 people may sometimes sleep in a cell that's made for eight to 10 people. And so the problem is so bad that people can't actually fit lying one uh, next to another on the floor and on the bunks. So the, the, the first one is a, is a photograph of a cell in one of Mexico City's prison. And the other one is a graph uh, that, that a reporter made for one of the uh, national newspapers showing like all the ways that prisoners have come up to be, actually, be able to sleep in the cells without being on top of one, it, one another. So you can see uh, the one hanging from the ceiling is a bat. Then you have the mummy who ties uh, himself to the uh, bars so that they don't fall on top of somebody else. Uh, the gargola, which is you know sleeping on top of the toilet, or then the uh, onion, which is sleeping against another person. Uh, so we're really, when we're talking about using this instrument, this is something that we really need to keep uh, in mind. The first picture is a prison in Buenos Aires. The second one is a prison cell in El Salvador. We have the same problems all across the continent. And uh, really, we need to think about prisons as a health risk in themselves. Um, there's a lack of medical services. There's no potable water in most of these prisons. 
there's no drinkable water. There's a difference between being able to drink the water and uh, showering. Uh, I was in a visit two years ago, three years ago, to uh, Islas Marias, which is an island prison in the Pacific that belongs to, uh, it's, it's a prison complex of, in Mexico. Uh, prisoners there got two buckets of water a day, and the two buckets are their rationale for uh, washing their clothes, washing their, their you know, uh, flushing the toilet, showering, cleaning their hands, doing whatever they need. Every person got two buckets of water. So really, not only is there no drinkable water, but there's no potable water in some of these prisons. Uh, there's no work, uh, working toilets. There's not enough beds. And then there's also the problem of overpopulation uh, comes paired with the problem of sex without protection. Uh, there's a lot of sexual assaults and also injectable drugs, um, which, which poses uh, uh, some of the problems that uh, Joanna was already talking about. Um, there's the, a higher prevalence of HIV, AIDS, TB, SCAVI, SLICE, and these are only some of the problems. Uh, there's a higher uh, risk of cardiovascular disease, not only in these prisons, but also this is, this is, these are, there are several studies showing this uh, from American prisons also. And even the levels of violence in these prisons represent a risk for uh, prisoners' lives. We had a, a big riot uh, last week in Mexico City. F 49 people died uh, from this riot. Uh, in 2008, a Mexican prisoner had the risk of dying, which was five times higher than the outside population. Uh, so all of this that we're doing is to protect people's health, uh, supposedly, and we really need to think about what the context is. Uh, when we're thinking about these, these laws in abstract, we can't, as, as John was saying, we can't think of them as something that is theoretical. Uh, these have a, a, a reality in which they're implemented. Uh, and also, these risks are not only for the people who are imprisoned, but for their families, which are known as the bridge population. They're the people who come in and out of the prisons. So if there are certain diseases that are more prevalent inside the prison, the, the, the visitors are also put at risk from these diseases. Um, so mo as I was saying, most prisoners in Latin America lack the basic resources a person needs. Uh, such as food, water, medicine, soap, toilets. This is an interview I did with a prisoner in one of Mexican prisons. Uh, he was complaining that he had diabetes and he couldn't get, he couldn't eat the food that they were, uh, the food that he was receiving was making him sicker. Um, so who pays for the things that people don't get? This is a photograph from outside one of Mexican prisons and it's a, uh, it, this is against the wall of the prison, and it's uh, everything that, that you need, the prisoner needs, are, is sold outside the prison so that the family, when they arrive, they can buy all these things and then bring it for their inmates inside the prisons. So everything that these people lack are actually paid for by the family with immense cost to their families also, uh, which is something also that we need to take into account when we think about implementing the drug laws and the, the number of people who are imprisoned for these crimes. Um, and then when we started looking, this was a previous study that we did, uh, so why are people imprisoned for, what are the crimes, the drug crimes they are committed and the committing? And we found that uh, a lot of people were imprisoned for possession and drug use. Um, in, in Mexico, for example, almost half a million people were detained for drug crimes between 2006 and 2014. Um, in Ecuador, between 2004 and 2014, the Public Defender's Office aided more than 15,000 people for possession. Um, in the case of Argentina, the, the cases that I'm, that I'm putting here uh, made up for 75% of the people that were arrested for drug crimes. So it's not only the cost that these laws are creating, but it's the reason that they're being created. And we're basically talking about users when we talk about uh, possession and uh, um, uh, possession crimes. And why is this? This is one of the questions that we were asking in the chapter that I contributed to the report is, is basically asking that question. Why is it that even though uh, we hear in, in all of Latin America that use isn't a crime, uh, do we continue to see users within uh, the prison system and within the criminal justice system? And one of the, when we took a, a look at the law 
uh, to see how possession and use is regulated. What we see is that even though use is not a crime in any of these countries, possession is always a crime in one sense or the other. Uh, and we even have the, these cases of, of uh, regulation for simple possession, which is basically if you have a certain, more than a certain amount on you, uh, that's enough to consider you a dealer. And so you go to prison for, for um, micro-trafficking or whatever the equivalent is. Um, and then I just want to talk uh, very briefly about the case of, of women and drug laws. Uh, if you're interested in this subject, there was a, a new uh, report that just came out a few weeks ago about the, the issue of women and drug laws, and there's a very good chapter in the report by Kasha, uh, who couldn't make it, but, but uh, it's, it's a very good report on the, the problem of, of women and drug laws. Um, between 2006 and 2011, fe female population increased from 40,000 to 74,000 in Latin America. And women, when, we, when you start to look at who these women are, they're usually processed and incarcerated for nonviolent crimes. Uh, in the case of Mexico, from the prison surveys, we know that none of them were carrying weapons. They were only accused of the crime from the, 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 the drug crime. And they're usually the first time offenders. Um, and uh, in some cases, for example, uh, and this is true for the case of Mexico uh, and for the case of Argentina and other countries, they're processed for transport or traffic. Uh, and the difference is that while men are usually processed for possession, women are usually processed for trafficking. Uh, and this is because they're the, usually the carriers. They're given a, a package uh, to take from point A to point B, and then they're detained at some point uh, in the, you know, in the middle, and uh, they're not uh, processed for possession as uh, men usually are, but for transportation. And there is a very big difference between the penalties or the sanctions that are received for uh, possession and the ones received for transportation, because in even though the people who made the laws didn't intend to be discriminatory, it turns out that. Uh, women and men commit different types of uh, uh, infractions of, of drug laws. And so in, in the case of Mexico, possession is sanctioned up to seven years and 10 months, while transport is sanctioned from 10 to 25 years. Uh, so it's a big difference. When women are caught, instead of having a three or four year sentence, they're given 17 year sentences with all the disruption that this means for their communities and their families. Um, so really just some final thoughts, uh, and, and, and I, th there's, there's others in, in the report, but uh, the drug laws, both national and international, have to take into account the context in which they are enforced and the cost they generate. Uh, I think something that, that this is, uh, when you go to Vienna and you hear the discussions at the CND, uh, I think it's difficult for the people there to really understand that the conditions of these, uh, the conditions in which these laws are implemented. Um, telling somebody that, the, or, or, or thinking about a law that implies the arrest of a person, uh, sometimes it's difficult to see that that implies the military, inter, uh, you know, intervening and detaining people and, and bringing them to the public prosecutors. Uh, when we think about Mexico, and, and I'm sorry to use that example so much, but that's uh, the one that I know better, you know, this is the police who detained 43 students and disappeared them, and this is the same police that uh, arrested five uh, young people a few weeks ago and also disappeared them. So we really need to think about which is the context in, in which the drug laws are enforced in our countries. Um, in, in Latin America, although the discourse is to treat uh, use as a health issue and not a criminal one, users are constantly criminalized, prosecuted, and even incarcerated for the, the use of, of these substances. And I think one of the questions, uh, or, or one of the main points that we make in our paper is that uh, de decriminalization of use means to think about the different ways in which to regulate possession. Uh, we can't just simply say uh, we're gonna decriminalize use and that's enough to keep users out of prison or out of the criminal justice system. We really need to think about how is it that we regulate possession because there is no user that doesn't possess. Every user at some point possesses drugs and so if we don't think about how we regulate that then we're going to continue to see users within the criminal justice system and even in prisons. And the last point, the, the case of women has to be addressed. I think 
as I was saying, I don't think there's an intention uh, a priori to, to be, make the law biased in the way that women and men are treated uh, by these drug laws, but in the practice that we see huge differences and uh, it really is very harmful and disruptive to the communities, to their families, because many of these women are not only ta care caretakers of their children, but also of their families. Um, and, and because it's, it, it's become very disproportionate, uh, uh, the sentences that they receive are, are, are truly unfair and there's no justification to uphold them. Uh, so I'm gonna leave it at that and thank you very much for your time. Good evening to everyone. Uh, wow, it's amazing to see this crowd in, on a Monday afternoon in London, <laughs> especially when, when I know this is an issue in, in many countries which are really affected by you know, some of the negative consequences of these policies, but seeing this turn, turn over here, is, I think it's is, uh, is encouraging as it is to see an academic institution involved in these discussions. Uh, one of the big problems we've had along the way uh, in, in getting to this point with, with the war on drugs is actually uh, the ignorance uh, and the, the actually looking to other uh, direction of many of the social uh, stakeholders and actors that needed to be there in, in putting solutions uh, to the problem. So uh, with this I would like to, to start uh, a small reflection on the uh, relationship between uh, drug policy and human development. Uh, for the first time, and it's also a historic occasion, uh, the UN Development Program has put up together a position on drug policy and, and in these issues, uh, which also had uh, historically avoided uh, not to step into the, into the mandate of, of another uh, UN agency that uh, actually deals with drugs and crime. But uh, as you are going to see, uh, the impact of uh, drug policies on development uh, cannot be avoided. And I, I also think it's encouraging to see this movement uh, in, in our house to actually look at this issue in a more comprehensive way. Uh, this is, this is uh, our position paper for, for, for the UNGAS discussion. For us, this is a, a wonderful excuse to put uh, human development on, on, on top of the discussion. We have a uh, recent uh, development agenda approved in last September in New York uh, to actually mark what should be the, the development uh, pathway for, for the world in the next 15 years. And in this paper, we actually try to, to generate an overview of how current drug policies negatively intersect with human development objectives and outcomes, articulate the importance of human development in international norm setting and domestic program delivery, and to actually review key opportunities for our UN development program to address the development dimensions of drug control policies. Uh, this relationship between drug control and development is uh, by the nature of, of both issues, uh, quite complex and, and very multidimensional. In, on the one hand, uh, the elements that shape and influence human development in our communities strongly determine how the drug phenomenon occurs in each specific context. On the other, Many aspects of the drug phenomenon, but mainly those policies traditionally developed to confront it, have had a strong effect on human development. We see this very clearly when we look at rural communities or urban neighborhoods where organized crime operates or traffics with open impunity. We see it in the distress of many people with addiction problems with limited or no access to effective and affordable treatment, or when we look at the horrible situation as Catalina uh, presented of prisons where it's impossible to generate basic rehabilitation programs for those locked inside, including a significant number of drug users. Yet, drug control agencies and development institutions and communities have tended to operate in isolation from each other, and policies emanating from the international drug control regime focus on, an, on a unique paradigm of drug control uh, characterized by criminal law, enforcement, and abstinence, have rarely taken development issues into account with the exception of limited alternative development programs. These programs are mostly connected to eradication efforts, 
and designed to provide legal economic opportunities to drug crop cultivators in rural areas where illicit crops are grown. Mostly, most limited alternative development efforts have not been effective nor sustainable, mainly due to the fact that the root causes that sustain the cultivation of illicit crops or drug trafficking have not received sufficient attention and political will to solve them, while displacing to other populations and territories the dynamics of the war on drugs. Nor have the development programs recognized drug-related issues or the impact of drug policies, as well as other illicit economies, as elements to be accounted for even in territories or countries in which they represent major factors affecting social, cultural, political, and economic dynamics, yielding, irresponsibly yielding to law enforcement agencies in order to take care of the problem. The enormous scale of the illicit economy of drugs, uh, which represent up to five times more than the global aid budget, leaves no aspect of development untouched and cannot be ignored, especially if we consider the fact that in many cases, the borders between the illicit and the illicit are quite blurred. Illicit economies generate job development and economic growth, food security or access to land and markets, determine financial sector trends and influence public goods and service, and service delivery, including security and political decision making. Furthermore, some specific development policies or their absence can increase vulnerability to problems related to illicit drug production, trafficking, and problem drug use. Illicit markets and economies become a survival option for many of those individuals and communities left aside by exclusive development policies and without many formal and legal options to obtain security and to be economically and socially included. In this context, involvement in the drug trade cannot be simplified to a need or greed equation. The influence of drug economies and uh, actors on development, livelihoods, and governance has to be fully understood in order to provide realistic responses to drug problems. Okay. Drug control policies are anchor international proposals that have survived for more than 50 years without major modifications. Its legal framework, its interpretation and transposition in national policies, as well as its everyday implementation in drug control institutions have traditionally been imprinted by a strong approach on prohibition and abstinence, chasing an ideal world free of drugs. Therefore, social or institutional perceptions promoting care and social inclusion of those who have a problem using drugs or those linked to the production of traffic are not yet dominant in most part of the world. The matter is still purely conceived as a personal choice and not as a problem rooted in profound social, economic, and health-related disparities that need to be addressed from a sense of our common responsibility. As a result, drug policies have been marked by fear of crime, moral deviation, violence, and disease, and have resulted in the exclusion of those individuals and communities linked to drugs, without consideration about the costs of such policies for our societies and our development. Additionally, formal political support openly expressed to confront drug-related problems often dissolves in the reality of electoral and institutional dynamics. Few politicians are courageous enough to pose different options to address the problem, thereby taking the risk of being viewed by citizens and political rivals as facilitators of vice and corruptors of our youth. Such political dynamics, added to the social disengagement on the fate of the most excluded, have become a strong factor in preventing the development of alternative and innovative policy responses and also in excluding important institutional sectors like education, health, social services, labor, local economic development, and civil society actors from the active involvement in the construction of more complex and effective solutions. As a result, these 55 years of implementation of policies emanating from the international drug control regime have left an indelible footprint on sustainable human development, imposing high burdens on our economies the environment, democratic governance, and most importantly, on our social fabric. On the one hand, it has provoked the creation of an enormous criminal black market that has fueled corruption, violence, and stability, as well as threatened basic human rights, democratic governance, legal economies, citizen security, public health, and the environment. On the other hand, and jumping from abuse to lack of capacity, the implementation of drug policies has generated more harm on human development than the one they were expected to reduce, leaving a trail of human rights abuses, including death, including death 
violence, discrimination, and marginalization of people linked to drug markets or drug use, mass imprisonments, imprisonment, restriction of basic liberties, exacerbation of poverty, negation of access to basic public goods and services, as well as militarization of public policy, deterioration of criminal justice and prison system, and equal application of justice, punishment to users, and degradation of environment, among others. These negative impacts have not been distributed evenly among or within countries, consolidating two major imbalances regarding the bearing of the cost of drug policies. The first of these imbalances has to do with the uneven distribution of negative impacts on the implementation of this regime within our societies, which has served to increase social divisions and economic inequities. Drug control laws, policies, strategies, practices, and interpretations, and their collateral consequences have been and reasonably tough on the weak and weak on the tough, impacting the poor and vulnerable populations disproportionately, make many of them additionally victimized while living in spaces where criminal networks already impose their laws and interests and where the drug war is being fought. Most people linked to drugs as producers or sellers, mainly the weakest links of this chain, do not profit significantly from these activities. These are poor pharmacs, that depend on cultivating coca and opium to survive, poor small uh, scale couriers, sellers, and people who use drugs, people who live in conflict zones. For these communities and people, including those internally displaced, victims of Latin graphs, deportees, ex-prisoners, or for those whose livelihoods have been deteriorated by economic and development policies, the participation in illegal activities is a form of social legitimation and offers an alternative survival economy. Additionally, drug control laws center on coercion and harassment, coupled with the lack of investment in quality and affordable, and affordable treatment, harm reduction, social inclusion, and other health services have also deteriorated the health of people who, who use drugs, as uh, Dr. Serge has, has actually explained. Moreover, due to the lack of treatment and hopes of recovery, Poor people who suffer from an addiction are more at risk of losing their property, being criminalized, not finding a job, or being victims of violence and discrimination. This consumption may lead, on the one hand, to a considerable deterioration of living conditions, and on the other hand, processes of social marginalization can be a determining element for problem drug use. It is not a surprise that when we take a look at the communities and groups mostly affected by these policies, they overlap with the same groups and communities mostly excluded from economic, social, and human development. Rural and urban poor, women, indigenous people, children, youth, and others. Besides, these costs have not been distributed evenly among different countries and regions. Some national or subnational realities present very different levels of vulnerability and resilience to different risks associated with the negative consequences of drug policy linked mainly to production and transit. Social, economic, political, and governance factors and conflict might contribute to the development and stagnation of drug-related problems, organized crime, violence, and social exclusion. On the one hand, and regarding developed countries, with situations mainly associated with problem drug use, the international legal framework and its institutional architecture has allowed for the implementation of a combination of harm reduction, decriminalization, and social inclusion policies that tackle some of the most important pol uh, uh, consequences of the international drug control regime for the societies, also reinforced by the greater resilience in order to solve these associated negative consequences. On the other hand, the cost of development have been disproportionately greater for countries most vulnerable to the risk associated both with drug production and transit and with the effects of the implementation of prohibitionist policies. As an example, only in Mexico, the estimated number of drug war-related deaths per year during the 2006-2012 period almost doubles the number of drug-related deaths in all 28 countries of the EU, without counting the disappear. Less developed and middle-income countries had to tackle with these unintended consequences within a straitjacket of prohibitionist policies in the framework of the international drug control regime and those imposed by the logic of the war on drugs, based on the strategy of attacking drug production at the source and before reaching the main markets. 
No room has been left to propose harm reduction recipes to be applied for production or transit policies in order to mitigate the most extreme consequences of the implementation of drug policy. We are now trying to defend a new paradigm based on sustainable and inclusive human development within the 2030 Agenda as a reference. As Professor Quay uh, actually pointed, the concept of human development represents a landmark in the way development is understood by the international community. It recognizes that the true wealth of nations are their people and that the main objective of development must point to the creation of conditions to allow people to experience long, healthy, and creative lives. Therefore, it is understood as a process that enlarges the choices, liberties, and capacities of people for their well-being and health, and also to have access to necessary resources and knowledge to live decent lives. This concept has inspired and embedded in the new uh, Global 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, this ambiguous blueprint for a better world with the broad, universal, and transformative goals that was approved in September 2015. As we saw, structural causes and consequences of the development and persistence of drug-related problems need to be fully understood and incorporated in sustainable development thinking, problem solving, planning, and programming. The negative impact of drug markets and policies on the capacity of many vulnerable communities, territories, and countries to attain good development results is something that needs to be taken into account by the development community within the new 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And as we saw, there are many contradictions between the goals of the 2030 Agenda and the effects of drug control policy, taking into account the negative impact on the capacity of these countries to reach these goals. In the Agenda, only there is one target related with drugs, which talks about uh, the need to have uh, availability of prevention and treatment for substance abuse. But nevertheless, the negative effects of policies impact 13 of 17 uh, sustainable development goals affecting in many uh, regions and countries, nearly every aspect of development. In order to resolve these policy incoherencies, the 2030 agenda already accepted by all EU member states needs to become a fundamental reference for the development of an implementation of a new breed of drug policy, especially in a moment where there are profound divides over the need and scope of an international drug control regime. The consequences of adopting such an approach must immediately change the way many drug control strategies are being oriented and implemented in practice. Its focus and priority needs to be on the main development challenges which should be promoted with priority over drug policy objectives, reduction of poverty, social inclusion, human rights, and public health. Uh, I guess I don't have much time. John, uh, the only thing I, I want to say is that uh, these are the basic elements of, of that approach. Do not harm. We want to abandon what it doesn't work. We have to fill the gaps of what we're not doing and generate new effective solutions within this framework, taking into account policy coherence uh, at national level and also at UN level. And this is, uh, I would say, the phrase that uh, actually uh, resumes this approach. At the end, drug policy cannot represent a factor that negatively affects communities or countries' sustainable development. On the contrary, it should become an element to facilitate and promote sustainable and inclusive development, putting people first and leaving no one behind. I will leave you with this phrase, wise phrase from the walls of the old Montevideo city, talking about uh, this issue, saying that without bread, without work, without everyone, there's no peace, there's no dreams and there's no history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javier. In fact, all the speakers, thank you very much. Um, we, we do have to conclude the evening in just a few minutes, but before we do that, perhaps I could take a round of questions. Thank you. Yeah, if you could. Hi, my name's Andrea. I'm from Occupy and ACT UP in London here. I've been involved in drug policy reform for quite some time. And before I forget, since we're in a student body, in the House of Lords on the 25th this, or this month at 6.30, committee room 4A. I'm giving you time to write this down because I want you to be there. <laughs> 
We're going to have a big meeting to discuss UK policy, drug policy, obviously, and um, the up and coming UNGAS. Um, I wanted to just ask you, Catalina, about the women, obviously, uh, being one myself, who's obviously affected as well by this stuff. So what, I'm just wondering what the role of sexism might play in, in what's going on. In, I just haven't got a clue. I was just thinking all the time, practically, that you're all speaking about what could be the reason why the women are ending up in the jail. I mean, I know th what the crime is, quote unquote, but uh, why are the women being used in this way or letting themselves be used in this way? What is going on? What are the gender dynamics? Okay, yeah. you Thank you. Yeah. Catalina, before you speak up, can I we just collect a couple of more yeah. questions so that we can get as many people in as possible. Um, okay, over here. And I'll come to you. Okay, thanks. Hello, um, my name is Carlotta. I used to study at LSE last year. And I would like to say something about Brazil, uh, which is somehow is quite similar to uh, Mexico and of course is part of Latin America and um, I worked there and went back there to do my dissertation. Um, what I was thinking is that during the pacification process in, in Rio de Janeiro, which is in a way such a um, pioneering project despite all the drawbacks, um, something has been done in terms of development, in terms of bringing in services and improve education and health, but at the same time, the whole discourse about drug policy has been put aside. So um, mm. it seems that it has nothing to do with the pacification and with violence. So in a way, drug dealers have been killed, have been displaced, in other, have moved in other areas of the city. But the old discourse about what to do uh, on drugs um, <coughs> has not been addressed. So um, I wonder how sustainable can be the pacification process without addressing the, the drug policy. Thank you very much. And then the gentleman in the back, there will be a third question in this round. I'll try and come back, but if we have time. <coughs> Hi. Uh, since Mexico is one of the... Um, uh, countries that you mentioned the most, and the one that has um, um, uh, w one of the strongest um, drug policies or drug negative effects, uh, could the people in the audience, could someone comment more about if they believe that Mexico is the country that has had uh, within the last 10 years, within the last decade, uh, the most devastating effects uh, of the war against drugs? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, first, can I begin with you, Catalina, on, on any... On Either yeah, Mexico, yeah. Brazil, or sexism. Yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, about the women. I mean, it's. I think it's. It's very important that this report is on. Uh, one of the conclusions has to do with the sustainable development because I think the fact that many of these women are poor, they're single mothers, they don't have any opportunities, uh, they have very low education. They're sometimes single mothers with with several kids. And uh, this is an easy opportunity for them to make money with absolutely no, or, or many times there's no other alternative. So, so it, it sounds easy for them. And it's also that they're, they're easily dispensable for organized criminals. And so they're, they're easily given up in order to get other drugs passed and say, you know, okay, well, there's that woman, you can catch her. And that allows other drugs to get uh, passed. And so I, I think part of the problem has to do also that they're easily dispensable and easily repra replaceable uh, within the, the criminal organized crime uh, chain. And the other, just, just one other thing, um, when, when we looked at women in prison for drugs, 22% uh, of them had their partners in prison. Mm whereas only 7% of men had their partner in prison. And one of the things, and we, we haven't gotten the, the data yet to, to see what's going on, but one of the hypotheses is that they're bringing in drugs into prison to help their partners or their sons. Uh, sometimes maybe, you know, if, if their son was uh, threatened, because we have a lot of cases where the people are threatened and they say to them, well, if you don't give me a certain amount of money, we're going to break your legs or rape you or whatever. And the mothers just do whatever they need to do to get, you know, some money into the, for their husbands or their sons. Uh, and when I talked to these women, they said, I, I don't care. I, I, I would have do, I would have done anything to, you know, if, if, if the life of my son is threatened. So... Uh, th that's just a hypothesis, but that's another explanation. 
Um, and, and the last thing is, I really don't think that in terms of the, the sanctions that are set in the law, I don't think they were intentional, but I think the reality is that there's a disproportion in the way that women and men are sanctioned. Um, so, and, and uh, th that's a very complicated question over there about the Mexico. I don't know if we, we can talk about that a, a bit later, but I think there's definitely a breaking point with a, with a call uh, from Cal President Calderon, former President Calderon, Calderon, when he declared the war on drugs. And if you look at all the data on, on disappearances, homicides, killed reporters, everything, there's a turning point with the declaration of the uh, war on drugs. And I, I don't know, maybe somebody else wants Thank to you. Thank uh, you. John, Joanne, would you like to? Hi, Andrea. And uh, on that question, even in the places where women don't tend to be uh, prosecuted as traffickers, which is the, the case in some countries. There, there's, I think you'll find it in the chapter in the book. There, there are a number of places where, because women are lower, generally speaking, in the sort of hierarchy of the drug market, they don't have the kind of information that can be used in plea bargaining in the same way that men, they're not as well informed about the upper ranks of the hierarchy that's been documented in a few places, including in the US, so it's a terrible situation. John. Um, I won't claim to be an expert on Mexico, but I think the, Mexi the Mexican case is instructive of a few things that we see at the international level, and mainly it is this idea of the balloon effect, is that, um, firstly, you shifted the commodity chain out of the Caribbean through intensive enforcement of the Caribbean and drove it on land. Now, arguably, when drugs go over land, they create more problems because there's more violence involved, there's more c officials to be corrupted, things like that. And so what we're seeing in Mexico is a byproduct of the of the basically just shifting commodity routes. And now there's evidence that it's shifting further down in Central America and with it, the violence that goes with it. As Daniel Mejia and Pascal Restrepo showed in our last report as well, is it's actually shifting the cartel activity out of Colombia and it's moved up into Mexico. So that's actually what we've seen. And I think the second point of what we've seen, and there's obviously exceptions to this, but I think at the broad level, Mexico is the example of the war on drugs pursued to its logical extreme. Let's go to war with this phenomenon. Let's decapitate the cartels. And it generally just created more instability and violence. There is some systematic studies now showing that higher levels of enforcement did lead to higher levels of violence. So that's, I think, some takeaways from that. Thank you very much, John. Now, the questions are quite open-ended, and we're really out of time, but Xavier, would you like to, to say a few words on, on either of this, any of these points that have been raised? Ooh, I broke it. <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> you can speak on that now. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, am I going to have to yeah, pay for this? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, John Collins will pay for that. <laughs> Well, in the, in the case of Mexico, as, as well as in many other countries in Latin America and in many other countries in the world, this is an issue. I'm not talking about production. I'm talking about transit. I'm talking about problem use. This is an agenda of social exclusion. And uh, it's, not, it's not a coincidence that Latin America is the most violent and the most unequal region of the world and is also the most impacted by this, by this war on drugs. So uh, it's like the perfect storm in terms of vulnerabilities and, and risks related with, with not only uh, uh, exclusion issues, but also vulnerability of, of uh, public uh, systems and, and govern, governance issues, which, which are, at the, I think, at, at the key, uh, a key element for, for the lack of strong solutions to the problem. I always say that the responses that, that many countries uh, and the international community have given to this problem is, is a little bit like uh, what the uh, prevention specialists tell us about the, the, the brain and, and the development of the brain. Uh, in children and adolescents, uh, there is a preeminence of the amygdala, which actually uh, generates violent and fear reactions in the, in the brain. Then after, after the frontal cortex of the, of the brain is developed, there is more uh, considerations taken, more maturity in the, in the decisions, more uh, uh, conscience of the risks. And I think the development of international policy, and, and, and especially in, in Latin America, has been uh, the clear explanation of a, of a very adolescent response 
to, va to a very complex, uh, uh, complex uh, uh, phenomenon, which links uh, with everything that has to do with, with development. So uh, we, are, we are given uh, standard measures to actually deal with many different uh, characteristics of uh, the problem in each specific context, uh, with each specific uh, vulnerability. So I think uh, the idea is how to revert this at this moment, put all the complexity uh, in the picture, put all the elements of, of harm that these policies have made to human development, to all these populations uh, like women, indigenous populations, rural populations, poor people, and, and actually make the right questions too. Is, uh, are we as societies uh, uh, completely convinced that we need to generate an ethical framework of policy to include everybody in our economies and in our societies? I think that's, that's the key question. And uh, uh, I think drug policy, it's a, it's a clear reflection of development policies. So if you don't have inclusive development policies, your drug policy and your penal policy is never going to be uh, progressive and inclusive. So uh, I think uh, when you go to Latin America, you see the, the perfect storm for these issues to happen. Thank you. Um, on those very wise words, I'm afraid I'm going to have to end the evening. I know there were quite a few of you who had questions. But I'm afraid I will have to end this now. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your interest and your enthusiasm, and I invite you to join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.